Good evening, everyone. I am Trevor Watkins, the chair of the Northeast Ohio Professional ACM Chapter, and I want to welcome you all to our remote tech talk, Got Robots Preparing Humans for Life on Moons Mars, by our speaker, NASA software developer, Kurt Liu. This tech talk is sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Professional ACM Chapter, or NEOACM, and it is co-sponsored by George Mason University Libraries. NEOACM is a professional chapter of the International ACM, the world's largest educational and scientific computing society that advances computing as a science and a profession. NEOACM is based in Youngstown, Ohio, and has been one of the most active chapters in the country for over more than 10 years. We meet regularly to discuss diverse topics and function as an intellectual geographical node of activity for ACM members, the computing community, and the general public by offering seminars, lectures, forums, and the opportunity to meet peers and experts from many disciplines. Our speaker, Kurt Lutz, started at NASA's Kennedy Space Center 31 years ago as a young college intern and then graduated to electronics failure analysis investigator. He worked as a software developer and tester for several command and control systems and advisory systems and he discovered his passion while working in the NASA Swamp Works Lab on software for robots and other systems that could someday help us live off the land on Mars during manned exploration missions. Now he performs exploration research and technology development. Mr. Luke enjoys, regular, enjoys speaking regularly to all ages and, and abilities from grade school students to college and professionals on such topics as robotic, Exploration of the Moon and Mars, NASA's plan to send human missions to the Moon and then to Mars, Swarming Robotics and Biologically Inspired Robots, NASA's KSS or KSC Swamp Works Lab Projects and Capabilities, NASA's Intern Program, uh, and NASA has used robots to investigate and explore outer space, moons, and planets for more than six decades. Kurt Luke, Software Engineer for NASA, will explain NASA's apparent infatuation with our moon. His presentation will give an overview of NASA's history of lunar exploration. Then he'll describe why NASA continues to focus on robotic missions leading up to the future human exploration of the moon and Mars. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Tracy will moderate after Kurt's presentation. Take it away, Kurt. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Um, I am, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start out by uh, showing you a, um, an inspirational video that NASA put together a few years back. Um, so let me share my audio and enjoy this video. Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. 
Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. All right. Well, I hope that video um, inspired you and get, got you excited about what NASA is planning on doing. Um, now, my presentation is going to um, dive a little deeper and give you some uh, another level of detail um, into some of the technologies that NASA is working on. Um, as, uh, as Trevor mentioned, my name is Kurt Lloyd, and I'm a NASA software engineer working at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And um, my presentation is all about robots. Um, and I'm focusing on the robots um, that are that have been used in the past and that are planning on being used in the future to uh, help us prepare the way for humans to live and work long term on the moon. Now, most people don't realize that we've actually been sending robots to the moon since 1959. That's more than 60 years of lunar exploration. Of course, the first robots, they were pretty simple. Um, and those first robots took some pretty low resolution photos. But as our technology improved, so did the data that we sent back to Earth from our robots. We graduated from just circling the moon to actually landing on the surface. And we got close up detailed photos of the surface. And this was several years before we were ever ready to send our human explorers to the moon. <clears throat> but it's been a while since we visited the moon, right? Well, that's only partly true. And that's because we never actually stopped sending robots to the moon. And I'm not just talking about the recent ones that have made the news. <clears throat> After Apollo, we never really stopped getting cool data and detailed pictures from the moon. <clears throat> In the late 90s, for example, we got really curious about whether there was water on the moon. And the data that we had in the late 90s showed that there might be frozen water sitting in the coldest parts of the moon and the coldest parts of the moon are inside deep craters at the north and south poles of the moon 
In 2009, we even sent a robot to crash into the bottom of a crater at the South Pole of the Moon, just to help verify the earlier data. And that mission did in fact show that water was there. And so why do scientists care whether there's water on the moon? Well, if it is actually there, and if it's there in significant quantities, then we can use the water. It's what we call a precious resource. Water on the moon is sort of like gold here on Earth. It's hard to find, and it's worth a lot. If we can get our hands on water on the moon and lots of it, that will allow us to send our human explorers to live and work there for long duration missions. And we won't have to ship tons and tons of water or tons and tons of oxygen from Earth. NASA has been working on several robotic technologies that might be able to find and collect water on the moon and be able to turn that water into other useful resources like breathing air and like rocket fuel. So let's explore some of those robotic technologies that NASA has been working on. First, we're gonna to need to find or locate the water. And one way to look for water is to send out a roving search vehicle. The rover shown here is designed to dig up a core sample from underneath the moon's surface and then test that core sample to see if there's any water in that sample. NASA plans to send a rover similar to the one shown here to the moon very soon in order to verify for sure that there's definitely water there and to find out how deep it is beneath the surface. The rover we're sending is called Viper <clears throat> and it's going to be in the news pretty soon. <clears throat> but what if a wheeled rover can't actually get to the water? What if the water is down at the bottom of a very deep and very steep walled crater? What if the water is inside of a cave? Well, in that case, one solution would be to use a flying robot rather than a driving one. This is showing a, a design for a flying robot that uses compressed gas thrusters rather than propellers in order to fly around in space or on another planet or on the moon. It's basically a thruster powered quadcopter or drone and it can fly in uh, environments that don't have any um, atmosphere like the moon. This robot is out to prove that we can prospect or search for water in very hard to reach areas like asteroids or even caves. This photo was taken from orbit and it's showing us the surface of the moon. And if you look closely, there's actually an opening to a cave below. At first glance, um, you could interpret this photo as a large crater, but it's actually a hole in the surface and there's a cave underneath the surface. And you can tell by the shadows when you really study it. <clears throat> the cave in this photo was formed long ago by lava flow near the surface of the moon. Wouldn't it be cool to explore this underground cave on the moon? There could be frozen water down there that never ever sees sunlight. This computer generated graphic shows what it might look like for our flying robot to explore an underground cave on the moon. And I think it's pretty cool. It's like right out of a sci-fi movie. Now wheeled rovers and flying robots are just two possible ways to look for water on the moon. But what if the water we're looking for is spread out over a really large area? One or two robots just isn't gonna be very efficient at searching a very large area. So we thought about what is efficient at searching a very large area. And we realized that ant colonies are, at least for their size and for their brain capacity, ants are quite good at searching an area, finding food and water, and bringing those resources back home. And they accomplish all these tasks without any real leader leadership or direction and without a map of any kind. Now I'm gonna pause this presentation and jump to another one that has a lot more detail about these robots. We call these robots the swarmies. So um, robots in general, why were, why were they invented? Why do we use them? Why do we need them? Well, the, it's, it's really all about the three Ds. The three Ds of robotics are um, 
Anytime there's a task that's dull for a human to do, difficult for a human to do, or dangerous for a human to do, that is a really good um, um, application to use a robot instead. And so that's uh, typically um, when we think of using robots. And why do robots sometimes copy nature? <clears throat> well, uh, sometimes uh, it turns out that the best way to do a task has already been perfected by nature. Um, you can see in these pictures, there are robots that um, mimic amphibians um, or salamanders with the way that their um, little pads of their feet stick to surfaces. Um, uh, in the middle, there are robots that uh, um, locomote or move around uh, using similar um, behaviors and um, movements as snakes. And sometimes that's um, a useful mechanism for moving around a, a particular environment. Um, on the right, um, <clears throat> we have invented, we meaning <laughs> um, humanity, uh, have invented robots, you know, that mimic certain flying um, um, animals. Uh, I think this one is modeled after um, um, a dragonfly's wings. <clears throat> and then the bottom picture, um, that robotic arm is really, you know, very highly modeled after the human arm. Um, and it can basically do anything that a human arm can do. And that's basically because, you know, human arms are amazing and they can do amazing things. So um, why not uh, <clears throat> uh, make a robot that can do the same thing? Now let's talk about ants for a minute, for a few minutes. Um, ants are capable of creating very large colonies that are completely self-sustaining. Um, in some cases, 20 million ants per colony is not um, anything out of the ordinary. This photo, um, I believe, is from um, a, a, an African, uh, uh, an area in Africa. And this photo is showing um, basically an archaeological dig of a really large ant colony. And you can basically see uh, they're digging under the surface and um, um, carefully digging around the ant tunnels and the little ant net, you know, the ant nests that are throughout the colony. Um, ants, ant colonies don't have a foreman, they don't have blueprints, and there's no single ant in charge. A lot of people, you know, especially uh, thanks to Hollywood movies, a lot of people think that the queen ant um, is in charge and telling all the other ants what to do. That's, that's actually not the case um, out in nature. The ants are basically born knowing what to do. So how do such tiny little animals with such tiny little brains accomplish these amazing things? They can build this really complex nest that supports the whole colony. They can find and gather food and water, not just enough food and water for themselves, but enough food and water to support the entire nest. Um, so, you know, when you really think about it, that's kind of crazy. The, their brains are so tiny. Really, they can do all these amazing things? Yes, they can. And so <clears throat> scientists, NASA scientists and other non-NASA scientists have studied ants and they thought, um, might we be able to um, mimic, you know, an ant brain in a robot in order to do complex tasks? Um, and we at NASA put on our thinking cap and thought, um, might there, might NASA need some robots some some time in the future that can do these types of things, build a, build a complex structure that supports other things, um, or supports our astronauts, or supports other robots, or supports operations, and two, uh, find and gather resources um, enough to support you know other things. Um, for the mission. <clears throat> and so going back to ants, um, what we did was um, we sent scientists out in the field to study ants. 
And so scientists, um, they go out in the field for days or weeks and they just, uh, they, they mark ants. You can see the picture in the middle, the, the ant actually has a blue powder on it. That's, that's a, a way, one way that scientists use to, to mark a particular ant and follow the ants, um, trail and, um, you know, not keep, not lose track of him. <clears throat> um, and so these scientists, um, basically write down field notes um, about what they see the ants doing, directions they're going, how far distances they're going, um, behaviors. Um, and um, the scientists watch the ants um, to figure out how they move a, a, around on the surface. Um, and um, uh, what, what, often happens when you watch an ant that's looking for food is the ant finds food, which is the middle photo there. Those, those little red dots in that photo are little seeds that the ants are um, looking for. And then the photo on the right is an ant bringing a seed back home to the colony. So the scientists um, write down everything that they see, and then they come back to the lab and study their notes and they compare notes with other scientists. Um, <clears throat> and, um, I know some scientists that have done this and then created a computer simulation of the ant behavior. Um, and when you, what it turns out when you take these detailed notes and you kind of reduce them down to the bare minimum sets of behaviors, um, uh, the, the scientists were a little surprised to find out how simple the um, state machine is, if you will, that these ants are basically, uh, you know, operating um, in. And so they basically put the state machine or this ant uh, behavior algorithm into a computer simulation um, and ran it. And, and on the screen, I've got some screen grabs of their uh, simulations um, user interface. Ant trails are shown um, in green, the resources, um, actually I'm, I, the, the resources are shown in, in red and green and yellow. Um, but anyway, it's been a long time since I've studied these, so I'm losing track. I'm a little bit um, uh, out of touch with the details here, but the point of, of, of this research, it moved from field research to in the lab computer simulations. Um, and then the scientists ran lots of simulations and, um, you know, worked out all the bugs that, uh, you know, that computer software ends up, uh, you know, having. And once they worked out all the bugs and ran, ran a bunch of simulations, they were able to prove that the, the efficiency of their, their uh, simulated ants uh, matched the efficiency of the real life ants that they had taken notes on, thus basically verif verifying that their simulation was a good simulation. It was a realistic simulation of the actual real life ants. Um, and so they had, now they had a uh, certified or verified um, ant behavior simulation. So what's the next step? Well, we decided to put this, this ant behavior algorithm that worked in simulation in a group of small robots um, and try it out there. And we call these small robots, the, the NASA swarmies. And it's really a, a very simple platform. This, this platform is commercial off the shelf. Anyone here listening to my voice can go buy this, you know, th these robot parts and put it together themselves. Um, the, uh, the, the magic, so to speak in, in this, um, system wasn't the hardware. It was the software. It was the ant inspired algorithm that we were putting on board. Um, that's what we were testing in our experiment. The platform we chose is a very low cost um, platform. It's not going to fly to the moon. It's not going to fly to Mars. It's a ground based research and demonstration platform to help us prove that this ant algorithm could could work similarly on real hardware um, as it did in a computer simulation. Um, so the robot, as I said, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, it has a four wheel skid steer design. Um, the, 
the wheels don't steer like the front wheels of your car um, in order for the robot to turn um, the wheels on the right need to go uh, in in the forward direction and the wheels on the left need to go in the reverse direction and that would get your robot to spin in place um, to the left and then you reverse the motors to go in the other direction um, that's that's skid steer it's um, a very simple um, uh, platform design you're all probably familiar with it um, we used ultrasonic sensors for obstacle detection. Again, this isn't going to the moon um, since uh, the moon doesn't have any atmosphere. Ultrasonic sound sensors are not going to work there. Um, but uh, for a, a, an inexpensive experiment here on the Earth, they work just great. And uh, um, it just basically detects solid obstacles in front of the robot. <clears throat> for localization, in order for the robot to calculate and understand where it was in 3D space. We used a, a, a very inexpensive GPS sensor um, along with a very inexpensive inertial measurement unit sensor. And, you know, the GPS sensor wouldn't work on the moon. That's not what this experiment was about. Um, <clears throat> if eventually we might want to send robots like this to the moon, but they would have to replace the GPS sensor with something, um, something different, a different type of technology. Um, maybe a lunar positioning system uh, sensor. Um, and finally, um, to detect the uh, resource, the resources that we had put out in the field for these robots to find, um, we just used a, a simple USB web camera, very inexpensive. Um, and we used basically barcodes um, as the resource that the robot was looking for. The barcodes were printed um, and set out face face up, and then the uh, the webcam was able to look down kind of from above and say, "Yep, I found a resource," um, and pretend to take it home. the The very first generation of these robots didn't actually grab anything and carry it home. They just pretended when they found something, they registered it and pretended to take it home. And then um, we had a, a a base computer that was keeping track of of which uh, barcodes had already been taken so that they didn't basically show up um, uh, if another robot came across them. Uh, they were basically invisible after that point. Um, this presentation doesn't show them, but there's a, there's another generation of Swarmies uh, that we actually evolved to that actually had a, a little robotic gripper in the front. And our resources um, uh, graduated from just being little flat plates um, that had a barcode facing up, we graduated to these little um, squishy cubes, you know, the little squishy balls um, that you use, um, you know, just to squeeze. Um, they make cube forms and you can print on all six sides. And so we printed these barcodes on these little cubes and then the robots were able to grip them, pick them up and bring them home. Um, sadly, I don't think I have any videos or photos of that. Uh, it's pretty cool though. Um, let's talk about computers. The computers on board these robots, same story, very inexpensive, um, not super high powered. Um, that's, that was a theme of this, um, um, of this experimental, um, project was to, uh, you know, cause if you're gonna, if you're gonna create a swarm of a robot, you know, you want each robot to be as, uh, inexpensive as possible. Right. Um, and so our, our uh, computers were um, an Arduino computer um, and a Linux compatible single board computer. Um, you can see the model numbers there. Um, this, this project is, is a little bit old. So you'll notice the computers we used um, are, you know, pretty dated by today's standards. Um, even our, even our second generation of Swarmies used an Intel Nook um, onboard computer, which was uh, quite a bit more powerful than this beagle board we used um, back then. Um, let me go back a, a slide. The uh, two computers were connected uh, via a uh, um, USB serial cable in order to pass data and commands back and forth. Um, so here's kind of a summary of the robot platform. Um, the the chassis, the main chassis that's kind of between the wheels, it's a little hard to see in the photo, um, 
that held our four wheel motors um, and our, our batteries. And then um, let's see, let's start in the lower right. Uh, the batteries, as I just pointed out, were inside. Um, and then just going counterclockwise, uh, the ultrasonic sensors are pointing forward and a little bit cantered outward. Um, you can see those in the picture. There's uh, a single board computer that's kind of hiding under the uh, lid there that's a little hard to see. There's a USB camera on top kind of pointing down. We originally tried to mount the USB camera lower um, and uh, it was a little too low to see, uh, to get a really clear view of our um, barcodes on the ground. So we decided to mount the camera up higher. Um, continuing around, there's a small uh, IMU, inertial measurement unit on the lid. Uh, there's a small GPS um, circuit card that communicates serially, I think, yeah, serially, um, USB serial. <clears throat> And the microcontroller um, is on that stack in the photo, and the motors are inside the chassis, so you can't see them. Um, let's talk a, a minute about software. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a home base station that we used that was keeping track of things. Um, and so that's, that's the laptop on the left side of the screen. It has a user interface for the user, and it keeps track of, of the map that the robots are um, basically adding if adding data to is like a shared map. And then everything on the right of uh, the dash line is basically on board the robot. So top to bottom, the robot has some sensors, right? It has ultrasonics. Um, those are uh, those are being read by an obstacle detection um, uh, node or you know piece of software. There's camera data coming in that's being um, looked at by some software that we call target detection. And then both the IMU data and GPS data are both being read by our localization um, node. And then we created a, a separate standalone node um, that we generically called motion control. Um, but this is like the, the critical piece of software in the robot because it includes those ant behaviors. It includes that ant inspired algorithm that the uh, scientists had turned into um, a working ant simulation um, earlier. <clears throat> and that motion control, the output of that motion control node um, is to send the motor commands to the motors, drive forward, turn right, turn left, etc. cetera. Um, as far as software, um, we used the Ubuntu operating system and then um, we used robot operating system or ROS on top of that. Um, and the audience I'm speaking to is probably familiar with ROS, um, but just in case um, it's a, not technically an operating system, um, it is a, uh, is a robotics framework that includes lots of great tools, libraries, data types, and, and lots of um, in, uh, useful conventions uh, that can really help a roboticist um, get something working quickly, rapid, uh, rapid design, um, rapid prototyping uh, kind of framework. It just simplifies the task of creating uh, robot behavior in your software. Then on our, our support laptop, um, we also use the robot operating system. Um, and uh, a really critical tool we used is the Gazebo Robot Simulator and um, some very useful plugins. Um, and the screen grabs uh, on the screen are from the Gazebo uh, robot simulator. And so once we had these robots um, put together and tested, and then we had the software put together, tested, um, we were off. We were outside, outdoors, in the parking lot running experimental trials on our robots. Um, <clears throat> well, we ran, we ran gazebo simulation, simulated trials to kind of in parallel to compare. So, um, you can see there were 19, uh, simulated trials and then 10, um, real physical, um, outdoor robot trials. Um, and those simulated trials and robot trials were basically, um, similar to each other. They were, they were matching, they were 
they were, you know, the similar parameters. They were two hour trials, um, four robots in a swarm, um, looking for a certain number of, of resources uh, in a certain um, configuration. Um, we did try obstacles and non obstacles. Um, we added obstacle uh, added obstacles later to the real robots. Um, and you can see the arena size 400 square meters. Um, and so we were able to compare the real robot results to the simulated robot results and you know, find some some things that were maybe not quite right with our um, our, our robot hardware um, or our uh, you know maybe some of our uh, software drivers or um, there's always a little bit there's always a difference between hardware um, real hardware and simulated hardware so we had we had to work out some bugs there um, and once once we worked out those bugs we ran some really long term we felt felt comfortable with our platform our hardware platform and the software that was running on it we decided to do some really really long um, Oh, I'm misremembering. We the long trials were in simulation, not on the real robots, um, and that gave us the long term trials were 12 hour trials, um, and we did a bunch of them, um, and that gave us a, a lot more data, um, and it allowed the robots to, um, um, you know, get past the the startup uh, things that always happen um, when you first start up a system. It let let them get into the you know, the real uh, long term operations and see behaviors there. <clears throat> and so the results of our um, trials and experiments were that these robots worked and the algorithm that had worked in simulation also worked on the robots. So we were really happy that, that we had success there. These robots were able to find and gather that we pretended in version one, we pretended they were gathering. Um, but in later versions, we actually literally had them collect these these cubes and bring them back to um, a home a home zone. But they were able to find and gather simulated uh, simulated food um, from an area that was unknown to them. Um, they didn't know where the food was. They didn't know where the obstacles were. Um, but uh, they worked anyway. They uh, they used a simulated pheromone trail to communicate with others. Um, I could really spend a lot of time talking about pheromone trails, but let me see if I can just um, summarize it quickly. Ants in the wild, if, if an ant in the wild finds some, a really giant pile of food, they get really excited about it and they can't bring, you know, a lot home. They can only carry like one seed, right? <clears throat> but the ant was excited that it saw, you know, a hundred seeds. And so on the way home, on the way home, while he's carrying that one seed, He's excited about the 99 seeds that he left behind. And so he leaves a pheromone trail. He leaves this chemical trail on the ground. And as soon as he gets back to the nest, other ants who are leaving to look for um, more seeds, they immediately, you know, sense or smell that chemical trail. That first ant didn't have to like go and talk to other ants and tell them that's that, that chemical trail basically is the communication. So it's a one to many communication mechanism. Um, so it, it scales, uh, it, it scales, um, you know, easily scales. And so one or more ants uh, who are starting their search um, regimen are, as soon as they, they smell that, that pheromone trail, they're gonna follow it because they know there's something exciting at the end of it. And so they're going to they're going to do their thing. They're going to follow it. They're going to see, oh, my gosh, there's 99 seeds here. They're they're each going to take a seed and they're going to be just as excited as the first ant was. Right. So they're going to leave another pheromone trail on top of the one that was just there. And the, the trail gets stronger and stronger because more and more ants are contributing to it. And the more the stronger the trail is, the more ants get sucked in and, and follow it. Right. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, control system. It, um, it, it calls the appropriate number of, of workers to, um, to work on that, that pile of food. And um, what's even more amazing than that is, is when the pile starts to dwindle down, the ants that, that grab the seed 
they they see that the pile isn't all that exciting as it was as as it was to maybe the first ant. So as the as the pile gets smaller, the ants get less excited about it and they leave less of a strong pheromone trail. And so the uh, over time the the pheromone trail is a, is a is a chemical as I mentioned earlier, and it over time it evaporates. And so um, there's a natural um, there's a natural ramp up of workers and ramp down of workers at the appropriate time. It's just a really great um, kind of closed loop control system that gets the right number of workers to work the uh, uh, the task. It's it's just amazing. Um, I've spoke. I've you know I've uh, I could talk more, but um, I don't want to uh, uh, take any more of your time on it. Um, what else is on here? Um, we simulated a robot battery charging, which isn't ant inspired, but we wanted to make sure we were forward thinking and testing how this was going to work on the moon or on Mars. Um, how does uh, robots having to stop and pause and charge their batteries for hours um, affect the uh, you know, the rate of um, finding and bringing these resources home. Um, the, uh, uh, the robots work together to increase the efficiency of the colony, which is kind of what I just described with the um, um, ants, one to many communication using a pheromone trail. We simulated a pheromone trail um, in our base computer um, by having, by having the, the robot that came home with the uh, with the resource basically tell the home computer how excited it was about what it saw, um, and then the home computer noted that and basically told that to all the wor any worker that uh, was leaving um, home base to look for a resource. So we simulated the pheromone trail without actually doing it physically. Um, and the biggest point about what we did. That we're super excited about was we didn't have to use really expensive robots we didn't have to use really expensive sensors on these robots we didn't even have to have really crazy um complex software because as i mentioned earlier this ant algorithm that the scientists wrote down in the notepads and then figured out you know what the what the algorithm was later is very simple and so simple software simple hardware inexpensive hardware can do these, you know, not overly complex, but, you know, there's some complex behaviors here um, that are happening. Uh, so the takeaway of our Swarmy research project <clears throat> was basically that biologically inspired cooperative robots are a promising new research area. And this kind of technology could provide some great benefits to future space exploration missions. All right, my next slide is just a screen grab of our gazebo simulation showing um, our obstacles, our, our robots, our obstacles, our um, simulated pile of exciting resources. Um, and then in the, in, on the left side is basically an inset of the map that the base computer was keeping track of. I do want to point out that because this is a swarm of robots, um, whoops, okay, because this was a swarm of robots, it's not that easy to control a large swarm of robots. Sure, if you if your swarm is only four robots, you could you could control four robots and not really, you know, have that that much trouble doing so. Um, maybe get a little bit of help from from a coworker, but you know that doesn't scale very well. If you if you're going to deploy a swarm of a hundred or a thousand robots, how are you going to manually control those? It's it's nearly impossible without an army. So um, we made a point to make our swarmy robotic system uh, fully autonomous, and it required no operator inputs, just a just a big old start button, and um, they were completely autonomous, just running through this ant inspired um, state machine. So that was our deep dive into Swarmies, but let's move on because there's there's 
other cool robotic technologies to talk about that NASA is working on. <clears throat> For example, once you have found the water, <clears throat> that's not the end. Your task then becomes collecting or gathering the water. And so we're going to need to dig up the dirt on the moon using some sort of mining equipment. Well, here on Earth, when we excavate or mine, we use really heavy digging equipment like this. And, <clears throat> excuse me, heavy equipment like this doesn't really work very well in space. Every pound that we send into space, every ounce even that we launch is precious and very costly. And so we've been researching ways to dig or excavate using very lightweight equipment. This robot is the world's first lunar excavator. It's not very big. It's about the size of a go-kart, but it's designed specifically to dig and to do it in less gravity than we have here on Earth. This video shows our lunar excavator robot in action in our lab. It digs using these large rotating bucket drums that have small digging scoops um, all uh, around the perimeter of those drums. And the bucket drums, they're hollow inside and they store the excavated material. And then you just rotate the drums in the opposite direction in order to dump out the material. It's a simple yet very innovative design and it works well even in low gravity conditions. Okay, so now we've located the water and then we've gathered or collected piles and piles of soil. And those piles of soil may or may not contain water or ice particles inside. And so what we need to do then is get the water out of that soil. And that takes some sort of a processing plant that is gonna be on site that can extract water from the soil. So this is an artist concept of an automated soil processing plant on the moon. This drawing shows an older version of our lunar excavator robot bringing soil to the processing plant. And that processing plant will be designed to pull the water from the soil using, uh, and once the water has been uh, removed from the soil, we'll just use chemistry to turn those water molecules into other useful things like breathing air or like rocket fuel. And the drawing I showed you on the previous slide is, is a, is a you know, high level futuristic concept, but many parts, many components of this future lunar soil processing plant have been proven at a small scale in our lab. But these parts and components still require some more development and some more testing here on earth before they could ever get turned into a real flight system uh, for launching to the surface of the moon. And so those were just a few of the ways that we can find, collect, and process water on the moon. But we also might be able to use the soil on the moon for construction projects. In situ means on site. So here are a few on site construction ideas for the moon that NASA has been working on. You're all probably familiar with common every, <clears throat> everyday uh, office 3D printers. They melt plastic and they squeeze it out a small nozzle. It's kind of like squeezing toothpaste out of its tube, but at a much smaller scale. And these 3D printers, they squeeze out layer after layer of thin plastic in order to build up complex three-dimensional parts. It's such amazing technology, and I'm glad that it's uh, so widely um, found so widely. You all probably have them in your offices and labs and homes. <clears throat> Well, what we did at NASA was we took this idea and we're developing the capability to 3D print on a much larger scale and using crushed volcanic rock instead of using plastic. We have had some success in our lab, as you can see from this video, especially when we add a little bit of a binder material to the crushed volcanic rock. But our goal is to eventually print using only rock and not have to add any sort of binder material to the mix. And this is because we want to eventually 3D print freestanding structures on the surface of the moon, like protective garages for storing future exploration rovers and equipment. And we wanna use only local materials because 
we don't want to have to ship tons and tons of materials like special binders all the way from Earth. Another idea we're working on is the creation of tough interlocking tiles on site. The robot in this photo is placing with a robot arm interlocking tiles on the ground, kind of like puzzle pieces. And this photo is from a field demonstration that we performed in Hawaii. But we actually controlled this robot from our lab in Florida. The tiles you see on the ground, which have a little bit of a red tint to them, those were made completely from crushed volcanic rock there on site using a high temperature baking technique, an oven essentially. So basically what we did was we used their dirt and we used a remotely controlled robot to build fill in the blank, a landing pad, a sidewalk, a road. Um, these things are almost exactly what we'd like to do on the moon someday. So in addition to these technologies that I've just showed you for living off the land, NASA is also working on the rockets and the spacecraft that will take our NASA astronauts back to the moon and eventually all the way to Mars. Our new human exploration missions to the surface of the moon, that's called the Artemis program. And that's fitting because in Greek mythology, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. So here's a look at our plans for the Artemis program, and I'll go through this pretty quickly, so hold on tight. First, the Artemis 1 mission, that occurred back in November of 2022. Artemis 1 was the very first test flight of our brand new giant moon rocket called the Space Launch System, or SLS. That same test flight of our new SLS rocket also flew our new space capsule called Orion flew it around the moon on an uncrewed test flight. And you probably saw the amazing selfies that were taken by Orion during that uncrewed test flight around the moon. During this test flight, Orion reached a maximum distance of over 268,000 miles away from Earth. That's far. <clears throat> that's over 30,000 miles past the moon. And that's why the moon looks so small in this image. The Apollo astronauts never saw this kind of view because they always stayed super close to the moon on their missions, which means that the moon basically took up the entire field of view out their windows. <clears throat> now at the end of each Artemis mission, Orion will splash down in the ocean, similar to the Apollo capsules. The first several missions are gonna be focused on getting our crews back to the, getting our crews to the moon and back. But eventually, Orion is going to be capable of supporting crew for long duration deep space missions. And the SLS rocket will be capable of launching very heavy modules and other large payloads into lunar orbit and beyond. But the Artemis program is more than just a giant moon rocket and a pretty good sized and very capable space capsule. The Artemis program plans to use the SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft to assemble a small outpost in lunar orbit. This is a conceptual rendering of the lunar gateway. The lunar gateway is a stepping stone or a gateway between Earth and the moon. It's a little bit different from the International Space Station that's in orbit around Earth right now. The lunar gateway is sort of like an orbiting construction site around the moon. It will allow us to build up infrastructure and capabilities that we can then send down to the lunar surface. The Lunar Gateway is also a stopping off point for crewed missions between the Earth and the Moon. You see the Orion spacecraft that I showed you, it is designed for deep space travel, and it's also designed for Earth reentry conditions. But it is not designed to land on the Moon. And so crews will also use the Lunar Gateway to check out their lunar lander and to move from the Orion spacecraft into that lunar lander almost like a bus stop or a train station. The overall Artemis program uh, plans and logistics tend to get a little confusing. So allow me to summarize. First, let's go back and review the Artemis 1 mission quickly. Artemis 1 launched an uncrewed Orion capsule on top of an SLS rocket. And that uncrewed Orion capsule flew to the moon. 
it actually flew quite a bit past the moon into a distant lunar orbit, and then it flew back to Earth and landed in the ocean, as I mentioned earlier. Artemis 1 completed successfully at the end of 2022. Now Artemis 2 will perform basically the same flight as Artemis 1 around the moon and back, but it will do so with an actual crew of four astronauts on board. Artemis 1 was the test flight or the qualification flight for Artemis 2, which is planned for 2025. Now let's look at the planned Artemis 3 mission. There will not be a lunar gateway in orbit around the moon by the time Artemis 3 mission is ready to land humans on the surface. So NASA has hired SpaceX to place one of their big future Starship crew rated spaceships into lunar orbit, and it'll be fully fueled in lunar orbit. Then we're gonna launch our four astronauts inside the Orion space capsule, riding on top of the big SLS rocket. They'll fly to the Orion space capsule, oh, they will fly their Orion space capsule all the way to the Starship in lunar orbit. Then two of those four astronauts will get inside the Starship and they'll fly that starship down to the moon's surface. They'll land at the south pole of the moon and explore there. Now, we've never been to the south pole of the moon before. All the Apollo missions stayed fairly close to the equator. So this, this is going to be very exciting. This mission will send the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon. Then after a few days, when they're all finished with their exploring, they'll get back into the starship and fly back up to lunar orbit. And from there, they'll get back into their Orion space capsule and fly it back to Earth, landing in the ocean, just like earlier. Our first mission to return humans to the lunar surface is planned to be accomplished in the year 2026, which is only a few years away. But because it's using technologies that we are comfortable with and technologies that we're familiar with, it should be doable within that time period. These first three Artemis missions are what it's going to take just to return humans to the lunar surface. But these three initial missions are really just baby steps that lead us into subsequent missions that will evolve into long-term sustainable human presence on the moon. By 2028, we plan to start building up the lunar gateway in lunar orbit. By 2029, we plan to have an unpressurized rover on the lunar surface that can travel kilometers away from the landing site for, sure, for short day trips. By 2031, we plan to add a pressurized rover to the lunar surface, and that will be able to travel much farther than the unpressurized rover, and it will be able to support the crew for several weeks worth of exploration activities. So it's sort of like an astronaut RV camper slash mobile moon office slash mobile moon lab. By 2032, we plan to have our first habitat installed on the lunar surface for our astronauts to live in and to work in, along with enough food and drink and other logistics that are necessary to support the crew for months, plural, plural months. By 2034, we plan to be in a position to live and work on the lunar surface for about six months. And then by 2035, we plan to be able to stay on the lunar surface for an entire year. You see, Artemis has to be different than Apollo. Our new lunar exploration program has to be sustainable this time, and it has to be evolvable. We can't be limited to living and working on the lunar surface for just a few days. We are targeting years, not days. In order to meet these long-term sustained lunar exploration go goals, we will need to live off the land and use the local resources that are found there. And so in-situ resource utilization or living off the land is a critical part of NASA's Artemis program. Now, once we have a long-term and sustainable lunar exploration system in place, we can then start planning and designing our human exploration missions to Mars. Those Mars missions are obviously going to be more complex and more risky than living on the moon, but many of the technologies necessary for long-term exploration of Mars, they will have already been developed 
and already used on the surface of the moon, and a lot of those will translate directly to Mars missions. And so those are basically NASA's long-term plans to get humans living and working on the surface of the moon and eventually to Mars. But why send humans to the moon or to Mars at all? Couldn't we just continue to send bigger and smarter unmanned robots indefinitely? Well, yes, we could, but we think we can learn so much more and we think we can experience so much more by sending humans to explore the moon and eventually Mars with the help of robots rather than just sending robots by themselves. NASA's right now looking toward future generations of astronauts to help us explore the moon and eventually Mars. It's gonna take a large team. Some folks will be working hard on the surface of the moon and some on the lunar gateway orbiting the moon. And eventually some will be working hard on the surface of Mars. But many, many, many others will be working hard back here on Earth, supporting all those wonderful exploration missions to the moon and Mars. It is gonna take a highly motivated workforce and a highly skilled workforce, both on the surface of the moon and Mars and also back here on Earth. And NASA's planning for that workforce right now because the astronauts that will live and work for year long or longer missions on the surface of the moon and the engineers and scientists back here on Earth that are supporting them are probably right now not much older than the students in this photo. When I go out into communities and schools and I talk to the students and I see their excitement and I hear all the great questions that they ask me about robots and about planetary exploration, I feel good about their chances for success. I believe they're gonna actually live and work long-term on the surface of the moon someday and on Mars, and that they'll continue the exploration that we've started with our unmanned robots. You know, sometimes the younger generation gets a bad rap from the older generation, but from what I can tell, the future is pretty bright. So that's my presentation about robots and lunar exploration and what NASA is planning right now for um, exploration of the moon, long-term sustained missions, and eventually Mars. And so um, I guess it's time for questions. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, we have a few questions um, in the chat. Um, and while we start to ask those questions, if any of you have any more, please start typing those in. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to Tracy. Uh, uh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Kurt. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm tongue tied. <laughs> I got a lot of uh, uh, questions to to ask you, and I want to start it out because this is one of the last things you said. Uh, so you were talking about the different types of robots uh, that's being sent, and uh, my question is as far as the humanoid, uh, uh, Boston Dynamics just revealed their latest humanoid robot that replaced Atlas and it's looking at a number of videos, it's pretty phenomenal. So my, my question to, to add to that last piece that you were uh, talking about, as far as robots on the moon, as far as all of these very advanced missions and things that they'll be doing in the future, uh, the robots you described were very specific as far as their abilities. Uh, would we, uh, would it ever be necessary to have humanoid robots? Would that even be practical to even consider having them? Yes, that's a that's a an excellent question. Um, my presentation focuses mainly on the um, robots that are necessary to help us live off the land on the moon but gosh you know once once we're there the the types of robots and numbers of robots that that are going to be useful and helpful um are you know i can't even imagine and definitely humanoid robots um are are on the list um you know you probably 
are aware that we sent NASA sent a, a NASA designed NASA built humanoid robot to the space station um, a couple years ago, a few years ago, um, and you know tested it out there, and that was that was basically the precursor to, um, you know, just the, you know a, assuming that it's successful there, and and you know if, if whatever maybe something went wrong and 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 we learned from it, but that's still a success if we learned from something that went wrong. Um, that's just gonna that's just gonna um, uh, ease uh, the ability, uh, to, uh, move that robot into, um, you know, the next, the next use on the next project. Um, any, <clears throat> any, uh, any environment that is made for humans that needs automation, um, could, could benefit from a humanoid robot, a robot that has fingers, hands, legs, arms, you know, turning valves, pushing buttons, um, Yes, definitely humanoid robots um, are plan are definitely planned for you know lunar colonies, Mars colonies. Um, you know the the gateway might even end up with you know uh, a humanoid robot um, it to work inside when it's it's uncrewed because unlike the International Space Station, the uh, the lunar gateway is is expected to not be crewed most of the time. It's it's more like a bus stop and sometimes a bus stop is empty when there's, you know, when you're in between, um, you know, buses and trains um, coming and dropping people off, right? That's kind of the way that the gateway is being designed. And so it's it's very highly likely that there will be um, robots on the Lunar Gateway to, you know, handle things that might come up when the crew's not there, um, both on the inside and on the outside. Um, so yeah, excellent question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a, I'm a start getting some of these questions from the chat. Um, Joe asked uh, what open source software projects are involved. I know you brought up the ROS is Swarmy, uh, not Swarmy, uh, Gazebo. So, uh, mm -hmm. Are there other open source uh, projects? When we're doing early research in the lab, um, we are basically free to use any tools that we find, including open source, you know, software, um, and um, the uh, what happens though when something gets closer to flight, the requirements get a lot more strict, um, and a lot of times, uh, open source software doesn't actually meet the. The more strict requirements of an actual flight project, um, although we have had, you know, some. Uh, uh, for example, there's a space version of Ross um, you might be familiar with or have heard of. There's a there's a military version of Ross that was tried to be started up a few years ago. There's a space version of Ross that tried to be started up years ago. Um, um, Ross Ross two, um, I think. Uh, I suspect ROS2 is is basically um, what those what the, the the military ROS and the um, um, the space ROS ended up turning turning into, and so um, ROS2 is is probably going to be the the version the first version of, of the ROS uh, open source software that we see um, operating in space because it's it's evolved to specifically to meet some of the more stringent uh, requirements um, that are required for space missions. Um, and so there's probably other examples um, that uh, I just don't have off the top of my head um, of open source software that that maybe out of the box didn't meet these stringent space um, software requirements, um, but might have evolved you know, been been taken on by a, a specific group or um, in or and evolved to meet the requirements. I do want to say, um, you know, less <clears throat> uh, there are there is space hardware out there. If you're familiar with cube satellites, um, there's space hardware like cube satellites that is so inexpensive, and the requirements are you know much much less stringent. 
and you know you can basically put anything you want to on a CubeSat, and you know because it's so it's okay to take risk um, um, on an on a very inexpensive payload. So it uh, it kind of is a trade off between um, how expensive your your hardware is and how uh, dependable you need it to be, um, how much risk you're you're willing to take. Um, uh, so it's space hardware is always a trade off. I hope that kind of sort of answers your question. Okay. Yes, I, I believe it does. Um, uh, we have I'll get one more from, from the chat. Uh, are four robots enough to activate the particle swarm optimization algorithm and the necessary statistical probability required? Good question. This is a little out of my domain, so I apologize. Um, but uh, I do agree that <clears throat> four robots is a very, very small number. Um, we used four robots um, um, because we've been, we had, you know, a very small budget for our project. But the um, what we did to kind of compensate for our low number of robots was we we did we did the four hardware robots and we did and then we simulated uh, four robots um, with with similar or same environments. You know, the, the obstacles were in the same place in the real life than they were in the sim and the, uh, um, the resources were the same in both so that we could run them side by side and verify the results were the same in both cases. And once we verified the results were the same, we felt confident that our simulation was was really simulating our real uh, our real life robots that we created and then we just added more robots to the sim because we couldn't afford to add more hardware robots it's you know didn't cost us anything to add uh software robots and so what we did was we and i didn't have this in my slideshow but we increased the number of robots in the sim um we it was after the project was over but we were able to do that um outside the project um, cause we essentially ran out of time and had to publish a paper and that's, uh, that's what was on the slide was what we published in the paper, but, um, we were able to run a lot more robots in the SIM, um, and, and, and collect some more cool data. Um, so that's how, if we had more time, we, we would have, you know, published, uh, uh, some more cool papers, um, explaining, um, you know, with, with a lot better st statistical, um, analysis and such. Hopefully that answered, even though it's a little bit out of my domain. Yes, thank you. Bob Paddock, you want to ask your question? Yeah, my, my question is, do these uh, uh, devices have any self-repair or will they able to repair each other? Anything along that line? That is, um, that is on NASA's to-do list. <laughs> it's not the highest priority right now. Um, but yeah, we'll get there. We actually had some projects in our lab a couple years ago that were focused um, mostly on um, part swapping, um, having a robot be able to, to swap parts on another robot um, and that sort of thing. And so we're, we're kind of doing early research in that area um, and it's just gonna it's just gonna grow and evolve over time and, and become more and more, of a, of a priority because that will help you with your, um, sustainability, long-term sustainability. Um, is it, if, if you deploy a system that can fix itself, repair itself, um, notice issues before they become actual failures. Um, that's all being studied by different groups at NASA. Very good question. Yeah. Other question you said, you know, I'm not sure how to word this. Is uh, is there like any open positions to be applying for for writing this software or anything like that, especially hmm. remotely? Hmm. What was the last What was the last word there? Especially remotely. What? Remotely, right? Um. So, the <clears throat> there's there's uh, a lot of different ways for people to get plugged in, and I'm um. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I know, but, um, it's, this is a little bit out of my domain too. There are, um, you know, to, to become an S employee, there's a website called usajobs.gov. 
um, the actual NASA badged jobs are on that website. Uh, you might get lucky to, um, and, and find a, um, a job there. That would, that would be literally quitting your job and, and getting another, you know, getting another job, um, though, which is not what you asked. I understand. Um, but there's, uh, there's also, uh, <clears throat> NASA, NASA has a workforce that is, <laughs> I'm trying to, um, face my camera. NASA has a workforce that is, you know, like this big, um, but we have a lot of contracts and um, we have a contractor workforce that's like this big. Um, and so it's actually a lot easier to get a contractor job that supports NASA than it is to get a direct um, NASA job. Um, so that's, a, that's another way. Um, we hire a lot of interns. So anyone who is taking college courses, um, go to our intern.nasa.gov website. That's intern, singular, not plural, intern.nasa.gov. Uh, all year long, fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, all year long, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of um, uh, internships you could apply for. The requirement is, is that, you know, you have to be a, um, a university slash college student um, to apply for those jobs. Um, but I feel like you're asking about kind of freelancing work, right? Um, that's, uh, that's, there's really, I, I, I don't have any good news um, on the freelance. There, there might be some contractors that, that might hire a freelancer. Um, um, so like there are some websites, usually they're like NASA procurement websites that will list all of NASA's contractors. Um, and you can just go to the contractor websites and see if they're, you know, if they're hiring um, folks and um, there might be able, you might, uh, find some job op some remote job opportunities there with some of our contractors um and that's that's probably the, the that's that's all that i know um but uh yeah. i'm really not the right person to ask <laughs> sorry yeah but one question you may have more in your wheelhouse is will any of this uh lunar uh development be used to eventually get to mars or will that all be from earth to mars directly that's a very good question um there are a lot of people planning and thinking um that far out in the future um and there are some they're just uh kind of ideas and running some simulations right now it's it's mars is really in the early planning stages of our workforce you know, uh, 90% of them, probably 95% of them are working, you know, moon and then like, you know, 5% <laughs> or less are, are thinking beyond that and thinking about why actually it's actually, that's probably not even the right number. It's probably less than 1%, a very small percentage of the NASA workforce is, is working on Mars because Congress is paying us to, you know, focus on moon. Um, but, uh, we, we recognize that, we, we can't be closed minded. We can't be, you know, um, not thinking about the future. So we do have some small pockets of NASA folks that are uh, specifically tasked to think about uh, long term plans. And um, yeah, some of their ideas, some of their simulations that they're working through um, involve, you know, leaving from the moon rather than leaving from the surface of the Earth. And there's a lot of technical reasons why that might work out better. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, okay, Thanks. thank you very much, Kurt. We, we got a lot of questions flowing in now. <laughs> the floodgates opened up. <laughs> yeah, it's opened up, buddy. Okay, so Trevor had a question. Are there particular ant species that were used for the ACOs you've talked about? The, um, my coworker, my, my colleagues, at the University of New Mexico, we're studying um, desert ants. I feel like there's some, another word that I'm forgetting. Some sort of a desert um, ant in in that was near near their uh, college. So New Mexican desert ants, I guess. Okay, I'm going to drop down to Anisha's question. Uh, he said, was the idea of an ant swarm the first 
and successful mimicry of nature. And the second part of that is, were there any other ideas that were promising or failed? Okay. Um, there are, if, if you just Google, you know, mimicry of nature or um, there, there are a lot of researchers out there all over the country, all over the world um, that are, that are mimicking um, nature, animals, and you know non-animals too um and so this was just this this swarmy um robot project was just one of probably hundreds or thousands of of projects that you could probably find um out there on the internet um and what was what was the uh, second part of the question do we have any problems yeah um uh, were there any other ideas that were promising or failed? Um, we were kind of focused on just mimicking these uh, this desert ant behavior. Um, we we were funded to a level where we couldn't try a bunch of um, other things. Um, luckily, the thing that we did try worked, but it wouldn't have been the end of the world if it if it hadn't worked, that's what research, you know, is about, right? Sometimes your hypotheses um, end up not being true, and uh, that's a learning experience. And then um, you learn from that and and try another project. Uh, I I think we got lucky, and and what we thought was the uh, was going to happen actually happened. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm going to go to Anoush and let him ask. His question. Um, I think I um I think I already asked it on the on the group chat, but my question was uh, how do you plan to ensure the durability of robotic systems, um, so in the extreme conditions on the moon, uh, so yeah. Thank you. So your question is, um, what <clears throat> what do we have to do to keep these robots alive and working in extreme environments like the moon? Yeah, in a very like sustain su sustainable way so that, you know, um, you know, saving costs on that, like how, like what would be the plan okay. around? I was just curious. Yeah, okay, that's a really great question. The answer is we're, we're really still at the beginnings of, of um, projects like that. Um, for example, the Swarmies were a ground-based research platform. They were made out of plastic and, and, you know, cheap metal. And, you know, they didn't, didn't have any plans on sending them to any uh, sort of rough environments. Um, we have another rope, the, one of the other robots in my presentation, the, uh, the lunar excavator. Um, that project is actually um, much, much closer to actually flying. And um, over the past, four or five years, we've been taking little baby steps in that excavator project to, um, to f take pieces of that robot and make them more robust, more able to handle being, you know, beat up and banged on. And, you know, cause a robot that is digging on the moon is going to get, it's going to beat itself up. It's going to be hitting rocks. It's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be very dust, a very dusty environment, a very dirty environment. And that's, that's kind of new to NASA. If you look at all of the prior robots that we've sent to the moon and to Mars, Perseverance, Curiosity, um, you know, Sojourner, uh, Sojourner uh, Spirit and Opportunity, <clears throat> those robots didn't get, well, <laughs> they, they were, they were science, they were scientific robots. They were scientists. Um, they, they, I was going to say they didn't get dirty, but they, they did because the wind on Mars, you know, dropped dust on their, uh, solar panels. Right. But they didn't intentionally make clouds of dust during their operation. They were scientists, robots that were very carefully looking at things and very carefully drilling little itty bitty holes. Um, but that's not the case with our first excavator. Our first excavator is going to get dirty. It's going to be making a lot of dust. Um, it's going to be hitting rocks. Um, 
And so over the past handful of years, um, we've been toughening up this robot in the lab um, and we've gotten funding to send it to the moon on, on one of the, uh, on Eclipse man, uh, lander in the next few years. Um, and uh, so we're, we're kind of in the middle to later stages of making a robot that we think is tough enough to handle that kind of environment. Um, your point about making it, keeping it inexpensive um, is a valid point, especially for a swarm of robots, because um, you don't want each robot to be, you know, millions of dollars uh, or billions of dollars, obviously. Um, the uh, excavator is is a little bit different from the swarmy, so we can and we could envision a large number of excavator, a large number of small excavators, um, which might be, you know, the the right solution, um, energy wise, um, and efficiency wise. Um, but our first mission is only going to send one, and so um, um, we're we're not quite to the point where we have to. Um, minimize minimize the cost of every little thing and try and make this robot as as thin and lightweight as possible we are making it very thin and lightweight but we are maybe maybe over designing it uh here and there because it's our first mission and we don't want it we, we want it to succeed and once we have our first mission and we can look at the results um it will be the missions after that that we'll probably focus on on making it more lightweight um and uh less expensive so very good question, thanks. But that's gonna be true for other missions, you know, uh, to other robots. The first one is gonna be maybe, you know, more expensive and more tough than, than it needs to be. Um, and then you learn from that and, and, and tweak it from there. And I think that's kind of a pretty common um, story in, in manufacturing um, possibly. Uh, that may be why things don't last as long as they used to. <laughs> In general, they start out making them, making them hard, tough enough, and then they try to squeeze out every last penny, and then and then things start breaking all the time. Hopefully, we don't do that in on the moon, right? Right. Uh, so we're at five thirty, and we still have a couple of more questions to ask. I don't know if you want to keep going. Let's keep going. I don't have any uh, anything pulling me away. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. We really appreciate that, uh, Kurt. Uh, I'm going to go down to Vincent. Uh, his question is, these ant colonies are effectively uh, effectively do a random walk until food is found. But we know where to look for water ice at on the moon. What extent of heuristics should should we be using for these swarm robots instead of pure random? Yes, very, very good question. So the um, the randomish walk um, algorithm is best in cases where you don't know where the resource is and it's kind of hidden in little pockets that you're that don't really have a an obvious pattern. Um, so we we suspect that on Mars, if we're looking for a particular resource. It, um let's let's go beyond water let's say you know uh we've got all the water we want um now we're looking for a specific mineral um on the moon or on mars that might be the um the more appropriate case to use like a um a random uh ish walk kind of um algorithm but yeah your point it, uh, about we know the water is is at the bottom of these deep um uh these deep craters at the North and South pole of the moon. Um, we're just, we're just going to land. We're probably just going to land, um, a robot nearish, um, that spot, or if it's, if it's a big enough crater, um, and our landing technologies, um, get accurate enough, which we are improving the accuracy of our landing technologies. Every time we, um, we send one, um, <clears throat> we might just land right in smack in the middle of a deep, dark, uh, crater. Um, but if we land on the, on the side, then we have to figure out a way to get the robot down. Um, uh, so, so yeah, your, your, um, your point is, is, is dead on. Um, uh, and you won't really need to quote unquote search. 
we're going to learn a lot from the Viper rover, which is our first rover that's going to dig down and um, take a sample from beneath the surface and, and look and see how much, if any, water is there. Um, and it'll be able to tell us how deep the water was based on um, how it brings up that sample to the surface. It does it in little chunks, so we'll be able to tell how deep. Um, we'll get a distribution of, you know, percent water versus depth, right? Um, at any location that we that we dig, um, and Viper is going not down into a very deep deep crater, but it's going in an area that is that is near those and on the edge of those, and there are some low spots there that are you know shadowy. Um, so we think that we're we're um, we think there's a high probability it will you know find some water there and give us some some uh, some depth information. Um, and um, once we have that information, we can kind of extrapolate and say, this is what it should look like down at the bottom of this crater. Um, and, uh, you know, once we have that data, we're just, we're just going to basically drive a robot right to that spot and won't need any fancy um, searching algorithms. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to John. Uh, any thoughts about a kill switch for the robot swarm? Yeah, I mean, any any uh, system you create needs a kill switch, right? <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, it, similarly, um, since a since a swarm, uh, well, I mentioned I mentioned that. You know, a swarm needs like a single start button, right? And it, because you know, you, uh, it's hard to keep track of you know a large number of robots. So you need like one big start button. You also need, you know, one big stop button. Um, but in between the one big start button and the one big stop button, um, it's always good to have uh, capability to you know monitor individuals of the swarm and control individuals of the swarm in case. You know, there's something weird happens. Um, so basically, the answer is yes. We would we would have uh, monitor and control capability of the entire um, spectrum. You know, the 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 group as a whole, and uh, and also individuals. So um, it's always it's always best um, to have uh, a fully uh, fully feature rich uh, command and control system that understands the whole system. Uh, both individually and as a whole. So um, we would definitely be planning to implement that before we sent something like that to the moon or Mars. Okay, thank you. Cameron had a question for you, Cam. Hi, hi, Kurt. I'm, uh, my name is Cameron. I think we talked before. I'm, I'm a software epistemologist at uh, CTS Labs. Um, it seems like um, the majority of the robotic plan is, is uh, there's a lot of uh, remote control involved. And it seems like the primary approach to autonomy um, is using uh, some kind of swarm search uh, technology. Um, does NASA have any plans to use um, other kinds of uh, artificial intelligence um, strategies for autonomy besides the, uh, the uh, swarm, you know, that general uh, category of, uh, of AI? Yeah, good question. There are there are researchers um, at different pockets of NASA that are um, researching different different ways, um, different technologies um, for um, autonomy. There's an entire um, autonomy. There's a there's a collection. Um, they call they call it the uh, NASA Autonomy Group, and it's just autonomy experts that are handpicked, you know, from around the the country, um, that are just focused on on autonomy. What is the current what is the state of uh, state of the current state of the art? Um, you know, where will we start out when we first start sending um, these types of robots to the moon, and where do we need to evolve to um, so that you know, we're not tying up our our precious humans, you know, sitting and watching, you know, data from a robot that could be, you know, turned into an autonomous system and that human could be working on, you know, more important tasks. 
like uh, you know laboratory science kind kinds of tasks that are that are really hard to uh, to create a robot to do. Very right. good question. Right, and to today, let me just give you one more. It's kind of like a um, a two part here. It is um, it. The question is, do you currently have or have we had any um, success actually on the moon with the swarm based um, um, approach, you know, actually in real missions? And uh, the second part of that is, why wouldn't we duplicate uh, the uh, ingenuity and perseverance team type search um, on the moon? That seems that that uh, that drone based technology seemed to be uh uh, very effective um, in, in terms of, of covering distance and that kind of thing. So uh, quite, first part of it is, um, you know, do we actually have examples of the uh, swarm-based autonomy uh, being successful on any uh, current or previous uh, moon project? And why wouldn't we uh, duplicate the uh, ingenuity and perseverance type team uh, search? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. The success of of ingenuity, the flying um, scout, so to speak, you know, and the on the ground boots on the ground um, perseverance. Um, that was an experiment, um, kind of a, a low uh, <clears throat> low ish budget compared to the entire mission higher risk compared to, you know, the, the rest of the mission, you know, trying to keep risk grow, uh, risk, <laughs> risk low, <laughs> sorry. Um, and um, it really, it really worked well. I mean, we learned some, some really great lessons about what does work. And we were able to try some things that we weren't really sure um, were going to work. And, you know, if we, if we had had a mission exploring the moon around the same time we might have tried it on the moon but we didn't we, we didn't have any robots that were exploring the moon so um it just happened that that mars was the environment that we had at our disposal to try this um this crazy experiment and it worked so so i can i can almost guarantee you that there are folks that are planning uh, folks at nasa and our contractors that are planning you know, um, scout um, types of, you know, flying scout types of um, missions to help us explore the moon. Um, and as far as um, are there any uh, actual um, operational um, swarms of robots on the moon? I think the first, I think the first planned um, uh, uh, swarm of robots is planned to go to the moon is, um, a handful of very small, very inexpensive robots um, that JPL has uh, invented. They're called Cadre, C-A-D-R-E. If you Google that, they'll come up. They're a very small, um, pretty simple robot, but they're going to be working um, in tandem and exchanging information and uh, working together like a swarm. And I, um, as far as I understand, that's going to be the the first use of, of swarming robots on the moon and assuming that that's successful. Um, uh, it'll just grow from there. Other projects will be thought of and um, it, it should just grow from there. And even if it's not successful, um, if whatever they're able to do, they will learn from and that can can still get, you know, get the ball rolling for that that type of technology. Great questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, just to add to what you just said, uh, as far as the swarmy, what, what year would that be? The cadre um, mission? Yeah. Um, you'd have to Google it. Um, I feel like it's within the next um, year, though. I think it's. I feel like it's coming up soon on one of the uh, the Clips missions, one of the commercial lunar payload services missions. Um, in the next year, I think is sending cadre. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go and I may, to... I may be getting my robots mixed up because there's a lot it, of it robots that NASA is working on. It's 2024 the launch day for Cadre. But I may be getting that confused. There may be a different swarm one. Is Cadre just a single robot or is it a swarm it's, of them? It's a trio of small robots that are working okay. as, as a team. 
Okay, I was worried that I was getting my robots confused. There's so many robots NASA's working on simultaneously. It's it's tough to keep them all straight sometimes. They're awesome. Uh, I'm gonna go to uh, Yash Walk. Ready? Uh, his question is: So what if the robot? So what if the robot find, finds a different mineral or ore in its path to find water? The second part is, does it keep track of what it runs into for further use? Good question. That depends on what sensor you put on your robot, right? <laughs> if, you're, if your robot only, uh, only can see water and nothing else, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive right past that ore and not even know it's there. So it depends on the funding level of your mission as, you know, to have what kind of sensors you put on your robot and, uh, what kind of software you put on your robot and if it's going to be looking for other things and mapping them, even though it can't, you know, grab and, and take them back. If you have the funding to do that, you're, um, you're going to do that. So, um, uh, it's, this is all still up in the air. NASA missions are getting funded, um, you know, constantly. And, um, uh, we don't yet have, uh, a funded mission to, find water other than the, um, the Viper rover that I mentioned earlier. Um, it has a drill to pull up material and then use a, um, uh, shoot the, uh, the chemist chemistry thing that looks for elements. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. Um, anyway, it looks at, at elemental properties of the material it brings up to see, um, what elements are there. So it is, it is not just a water sensor and, um, most robots I think are not just, just going to have a water sensor and ignore everything else. I think, um, that's probably not very likely. So, yeah, I think what's, what's more likely to happen is that it's, if it sees something interesting, it's going to, uh, note it, um, you know, stop and ask the user, what should I do about this? Um, and then the operator will probably note it and then continue on with the mission so that a future um, mission or a future, you know, astronaut with a with a hammer and a drill, you know, can come and and collect it and take it back to the lab. Good question. Fantastic. These are very good questions. Uh, I'm going to go to Joel Trevor. They're asking a similar question. Why was the moon chosen for robot mining work? rather than asteroids? Um, that's a simple answer because Congress is funding us to go to the moon, not funding us to go to asteroids. It's all, <laughs> it's, it's all about uh, what Congress tells us to do. And that's all about what the president tells Congress. Well, <laughs> there's, uh, it, there's a little bit of back and forth. You know, the president has um, their uh, wish list and Congress has their wish list and uh, they're all trying to please their constitu constituents, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then NASA has their wish list that they pass up and hope that it comes back down. You know, this is like a mother may I, and then they get, well, you can do this, but not this. Um, that's just how the political system works um, in this country. So um, we're, we're tied to that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, what is the biggest current challenge area in developing space robots? So the space robot that I am helping develop right now is the excavator that I showed you in my presentation. That's the one that's going to get real dirty. Um, it's going to get real messy. It's going to get real beat up. Um, and so I can, t I can tell you what we're focusing on. Um, but, uh, that's just cause that's the, that's the current project I'm on. Um, the dust, um, just can get everywhere. And the Apollo astronauts, you know, they found that out immediately. Um, it got, you know, all over their suits and it kind of stuck. There's like a static cling kind of thing that happens. Um, and it was really hard to to get the, the moon dust off of their suits. And so they ended up bringing that moon dust inside um, their spacecraft when they were, you know, coming back in. Um, that's, that alone is a problem because um, the moon dust is not that friendly to human skin. It can be very irritable, ir irritant 
um, because the particles are very jagged and sharp because there's no um, there's no erosion processes on the moon to smooth out dust particles. They're jagged, they're sharp. Um, it's like kind of like broken glass. It can, um, it can be an irritant to the skin. It can be an irritant to soft tissue like eyes. Um, if you breathe it, if it gets airborne and you breathe it in, it can, it can damage your lungs. It's, it's serious stuff and it can get airborne very easily. Once you get back into, um, an, a, an environment inside where you've got air again, um, it can become airborne because the particles are very, very teeny tiny. It's almost like, um, like a uh, baking flour, um, the very, very small particles. So they, if you let them get airborne, they're going to stay airborne. Um, so there's, there's those kinds of issues, um, that, that NASA has, has to solve. We don't want to put our astronauts, um, we don't want to, we don't want to hurt their skin, their lungs, um, so on and so forth. Um, it also gets in seals. Um, it, you've probably seen the astronauts gloves get, you know, attached their helmet, get, you know, attached. Those attachment points have soft rubber seals basically. And dust can get in there if, if we don't like make, take, uh, special measures to keep it out. And as I said, that dust is, is sharp, like broken glass, and it can do damage to those rubber seals, which over the long term is, is, is a bad, is a bad thing. Um, it could really, you know, ruin a suit over the long, uh, the long haul. Um, and the, the Apollo astronauts found this out. This is not new, um, new information. Well, now that we want to send robots, that are going to be getting dirty and digging and, and, and lofting dust. Um, robot, any robot that has a moving part has, has to have a seal, um, a sealing surface that, 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 that this dust could get in, um, and could do damage. So just like the, the glove seal, our robot wheels have to seal and keep that dust out. Um, we also want to keep dust off of, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, Mars robots that had solar panels, um, Mars dust would settle on those solar panels over time. And on the moon, that hasn't been a huge issue so far because we have, we haven't been lofting a lot of lunar dust in our prior missions, but our prior missions have not been digging down to, to get for what, to get to the water. So our, our new lunar excavator, um, is going to be kind of a first of its kind. It's going to be digging down. It's going to be digging down maybe three feet, maybe four or five feet. Um, we don't know until we get the data from Viper, um, how deep this robot has to dig. Um, and, um, so it could be making clouds, literally clouds of dust around it while it's operating. Um, not a good environment. Um, we have to, we have to figure out how to keep the dust out of the sensitive parts of this robot. Um, if our robot depends on cameras, a, a, a cloud of dust could um, impact the mission. We have to solve that problem. If our robot has, um, uh, where I was going a, a minute ago was with solar panels um, on Mars. If our if our robot has a solar panel that could get um, you know completely covered up by dust, that's no good. So we're not planning on using solar panels. We're planning on being completely battery operated and and always being able to go back to the lander to charge. So we're having to think about these things. So we solved the, we solved the solar panel problem, but then it turns out we have a similar problem uh, with heat rejection in order to reject heat that builds up um, while your robot's operating. Um, the most common thing to do is have a, a radiator that is facing the, um, the blackness of space um, to radiate away heat. Well, if you're doing that, if that's your design, and, it, and if your radiator gets covered up with dust, then your robot can't radiate the heat and it overheats. So um, our very first robots, we're gonna put a lid and when we're over the radiator and then when we're digging, the lid's always closed. And then when, once we're, uh, once it's time to reject the heat, we're gonna do that discreetly. We're gonna, we're gonna drive away from the dig site to an area where there, you know, uh, there's no dust and then we'll open up our radiator and. Um, so these are the types of things you have to think about and design into your system. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to Nicholas 
what are the biggest differences you have to account for with the difference of terrain? I have seen NASA use very different wheels. Would this also apply to these robots? <clears throat> yeah, we, um, yeah, mobility on the moon there's a there's a lot of different terrain on the moon. There are some you know vast flat lands with a, occasional rocks that you can avoid. Um, but um, if if you if you dive down a rabbit hole looking at old Apollo images, there are some scary looking areas. There are some rock fields that I mean you would not even want to walk in. There's there there the rocks are so close and piled onto each other. Um, that would be dangerous for an astronaut to even try and um, and go through a rock yard like that, um, let alone a, a robot that has a lot less control, a lot a lot fewer um, degrees of freedom, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we our our initial missions are going to be very conservative. We're going to make sure we go to a very, you know, mostly flat spot that um, doesn't look like it has you know a lot of scary um scary terrain um but yeah eventually over time as we as we evolve toward these long-term sustained missions we're going to want to explore these more scary areas and so i think our robotic systems are going to have to evolve um uh beyond current technologies there are some um there's some uh f folks at jpl who are really pushing the envelope on um, uh, robotic uh, mobility technologies. Um, they've got some robots that are like climbing robots that use like um, salamander pad types of feet that, that just have um, a lot of grip force um, in a small area. And, you know, basically they're designing robots that can climb rock faces, sheer rock faces and, things like that. There are groups at NASA that have uh, designed repelling robots that can repel down into a, a steep, uh, a steep walled crater or, or just down a, um, a cliff face. Um, so yeah. And, you know, we've got ideas for robots that can uh, fly around that can fly over really scary areas like our cave um, flyer that I described earlier. So yeah, there's a lot of different, uh, pockets of um, research that are happening around NASA um, to look at, uh, to come up with new uh, locomotion techniques um, for robots that we might need to use in the future. Good question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any collaboration with SpaceX on these projects you've worked on? Yeah, that's a really good question. SpaceX, um, when I first started um, on my Swarmy project, and I was kind of new to um, the, the 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 lab that I'm now working not I've now been working in for ten years now, um, they uh, they were having some meetings with SpaceX back then, um, and they were basically educating the well it, I guess it was an information exchange. Um, uh, they were telling uh, the SpaceX folks about all of our um, uh, ISRU ideas, our, our in-situ resource utilization ideas, and why, you know, why we were um, considering, you know, living off the land, you know, in order to save money for logistics flights and that sort of thing. This is before, before Artemis. I'm talking like 10 years ago. Um, and... Um, I'm sure the SpaceX folks were, were giving it. I wasn't actually in these meetings. I was just a very new employee. Um, <clears throat> but um, that's just one example. We, um, we NASA, um, communicate with, we partner with, you know, we have, you know, little contracts here and there with um, all these companies, you know, the SpaceX, Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, all of these companies uh, relativity space, um, you, you name it. Um, <clears throat> all, all of these companies are all, um, thinking about this thing. Um, they're all thinking about how can we save money? Um, 
how can we do things long term and sustain instead of just one off things, you know, instead of just publicity stunts, how can we how can we do it right? Um, and so the the short answer is I've already I've already started a long answer, but the short answer is um, yes, NASA um, has a lot of different ways to partner and communicate um, with um, companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, and and all those companies have um, parts of their organization that are focusing on uh, on that area. ISRU living off the land. Um, reuse, uh, keeping costs down and that sort of thing. Um, some companies are more public about their research and development in these areas than others. Um, I suspect that, uh, I suspect that, you know, a company like Blue Origin, even though it, uh, isn't as, uh, vocal about what they're doing, I suspect that they're really you know, keeping up pretty good with what SpaceX is doing. It's just that we hear about it every day from SpaceX because they're so vocal about it. Um, but uh, I suspect that we're going to be surprised one day to see how far, you know, a company like Blue Origin is um, uh, once they finally reveal to us and, and try it out. Um, that's my prediction. Okay, thank you for that. It's, it's almost six o'clock. I, I got only like two questions left. Is, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can do a okay. couple more. Okay, so uh, given the longer transit times and distinct environmental conditions between the moon and Mars, what factors contribute to the strategic decision to prioritize robotic missions to the moon over direct missions to Mars? Hmm. The strategic decision is, is being made by politicians... <laughs> <laughs> in Washington, D.C., right? Um, NASA, NASA can suggest, you know, we think this is the right path and that we think this is what you should do. Um, but we're using taxpayer dollars. So, you know, the buck stops at um, Congress giving us those taxpayer dollars. And not only giving us those taxpayer dollars, but they tell us, you spend this money on this, you spend this money on that, and you spend this money on that. It's really that level of direction. So we don't have autonomy to do um, any, anything we want to do. Sadly, that's just uh, the system that we've set up and been operating on for 60 years now. Uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> that's unfortunate for but, <clears throat> that being said it does it it uh it it looks like it's going to have a good ending because um even even though the the congress and the money is saying um focus on this focus on the moon focus on long-term sustained lunar missions focus on the technologies that you need to live and work there long term um and we're not just we're not just going off on our own against their will to think about um, Mars. You know, we have some folks that are directed by Congress. Think think about Mars. Think about um, you know what what can translate to Mars and what can't. Um, it's just a lot less money focused on Mars than is focused on the Moon. Um, so the the good news is is that um, we haven't forgotten about Mars. It's, it's the, it's the moon to Mars. Artemis is the moon to Mars program. It's not just the moon program. Um, if you Google NASA moon to Mars, you'll see, you know, you'll see all of the, um, that, that, that's, that's really the, the program that we're operating under. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 if we had infinite amount of money, we would be we would be spending a lot of money on the moon and a lot of money on Mars, um, but that's you know the uh, the hard fact is is that we have this much money, and so let's spend you know this much of it on the moon and this much of it on Mars, and then over time it'll it'll shift right it'll um, it, it'll shift to Mars once we once we're comfortable with the moon, um, and and there will be some technologies that will translate directly. 
um, some technologies won't, and so we'll have to spend a little bit more uh, money on the money and time on those. Um, but there are some technologies that are going to translate directly, and we think our our um, uh, low gravity excavator that we're designing is one technology that'll that'll almost be able to transition, you know, to Mars without with with very little um, tweaks. Okay, so our last one, it was a couple of questions about uh, languages. Uh, what kind of languages are used to program robots? So there's laboratory robots that are experimental and researchy. Um, and then there are flight robots. So there's really two different answers. In the lab, we can use anything we want. Um, you know, if you're using robot operating system, um, you're going to be writing uh, C code or C++ code or um, Python, um, you know, you can, you can do really quick iterations and testing, you know, um, try out a lot of different things, you know, using a scripting, a common scripting language like Python. So Python is getting um, pretty popular in the, in the Ross world, or it has been for a while. Um, but if you, if you need something a, a lot faster then you might, you know, compile some C code or some C++ code. Um, we dabble in both of those areas um, in our lab, um, but that stuff isn't flying. Um, a robot like Perseverance, that is a very expensive robot. Uh, we can't take any risk with this robot. It has to, has to, has to work. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna be um, not only compiling C code, but you're gonna be very strict with what you allow um, in that C code. If you Google, um, um, I don't know that I, I can't remember the the best keywords, but there's a there's a um, uh, there's a coding standard that NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, um, developers um, have to meet, um, uh, and so you can read about some of the some of the restrictions of their C code um, if if you were to Google that. Now there's an in between. Those are kind of our two extremes: lab and like a very expensive Perseverance type rover. Um, there's an in between now um, in the current space. Um, marketplace there's the uh commercial lunar payload services missions right those are commercial missions um sending small payloads small experiments to the moon our lunar excavator is actually going to be on a uh, eclipse mission um and so this is actually in between this is not a ex super expensive perseverance rover this is kind of like the cu the cubesat of uh lunar rovers um Let's keep it as inexpensive as we can. Let's use, you know, commercial products um, if we can prove that they, you know, won't completely die as soon as they land on the moon. Um, you know, co commercial uh, computers, um, you know, commercially available software. Um, we, we have pretty much talked ourselves into um, um, using ROS on our, um, using like a, a, an Ubuntu operating system and ROS on our first, um, our first mission, knowing that, um, and, and, a, and, a, and a single board computer that we've picked is basically just com commercially available, knowing the trade-off being that, you know, there will be energetic particles, you know, flying through space that are going to hit our board and are going to make, you know, make it, you know, reboot maybe, you know, several times a day. And you wouldn't want that to happen on your Perseverance rover. Um, so you protect against that and you spend a lot more time and money um, making sure that doesn't happen. But for our mission, um, as, as uh, a much, much lower funded mission, it's basically just a, an experiment. It's technically, it's called a technology demonstration. That's, the, um, that's what NASA calls um, our type of mission. Uh, you can just think of it like an experiment one of many experiments is going to be flying on a clip, a future eclipse lander. And, you know, worst case scenario, if, if our robot just doesn't work, um, it's not the end of the world. It didn't cost that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, and if it, if it has to, you know, if we have to sit through, um, you know, 
six or eight or 10 annoying computer reboots um, every day of our 11 day mission, that's not the worst thing that could happen. That's not the end of the world. So these are, these are risks that we are willing to take on our mission based on its funding level. Um, so I actually forgot what the original question was. Did I even answer it? <laughs> I've been just, yeah, I've been just yeah. babbling on so about, long. It was about languages. It was about languages, yes. I, 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 mm -hmm. I, so we're, we're going to use Ross on our robot because it's in between those two um, extremes. We're, we're, um, we're allowed to take that kind of risk and, and we're okay with some of the, uh, some of the downfalls of, you know, using a, a computer that isn't, you know, um, super, super expensive and super, super highly space rated and, um, you know, able to handle, uh, you know, these energetic particles like a much more expensive computer can. Um, so everything is, is a trade-off, um, and, and uh, everything costs money. So that's that's part of the trade-off. Um, so we'll, we're gonna be probably compiling C on our um, on our robot. We, we likely won't just fly Python scripts, but for the ground, we're gonna, we're gonna prove things using Python scripts because it's just a quicker iterative process. Once we prove the algorithm that we want, we'll probably just uh, port it into a, a compile, compiled C code. Wow. Okay. So that's going to have to be all the amazing question. questions. Yes. The question <laughs> uh, attendees, they were really quality, fantastic questions. Very good Excellent. questions. Excellent. Yeah, very and, thanks, everybody. And Kurt, your, your answers are were phenomenal. Fantastic <laughs> presentation. It's everything. Every time we have this interaction with you is very enjoyable, very informative. You're such a nice guy to, to spend this extra time at 610. Uh, I do want to ask another favor because it was a couple of questions I didn't get to. Can I email them to you and get answers and then I can send it back to everybody? Sure. Happy to do that. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. I appreciate you all. Thank you all for watching yeah. and both live and people who watch this later. Um, on the recording. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Yes, Thanks, we're, sir. We're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, edit the uh, recording and post it and send it out to everybody so they can uh, look at it at their leisure. All right. If I said anything stupid, make sure you edit that out. Yes, you will give first crack, <laughs> first crack, and say, "Hey, can you take that out? Can you edit that out?" Yeah. But it's not to edit. Uh, I'm kidding. Go for it. <laughs> It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you much. Okay, go ahead, Trev. Thank you. No, go I, was ahead, gonna, I was gonna say, I was gonna thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming. And again, thank you, Kurt, uh, for a wonderful presentation um, and sticking um, by past the time uh, to answer questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. And a lot of uh, these were students who are computer science majors. Uh, so I know they've benefited greatly from this. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks again. Everyone have a good evening.